Here's a guy I would have loved to have talked to. But Terry, yes for me. Gentleman Gene Kaniski, by his own proclamation, Canada's greatest athlete, and one heck of a wrestler. Gene quit a career in football in the early 1950s to wrestle professionally because he knew wrestlers made good money and didn't have to take orders from anybody. He was, and still is, the guy with the crew cut, a guy who enjoys physical contact and hard work, a real man's man. When I was a young boy, and I was going against people uh, like Lou Thez, who was just a tremendous, tremendous athlete. And they're new, you know, there's no way you can uh, beat him because he was a professional and I was just stepping from the amateur ranks to the pro ranks. But uh, as time went on, I became uh, very, very polished and I uh, knew how to hook a person and hurt him. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, one day, and uh, it was a Black Tuesday, I guess, no, it was a Friday in St. Louis that I defeated him for the world title. And of course, you had the great whipper, Billy Watson, and uh, uh, Wilbur Snyder, Vern Gagne, they could go on and on, Yukon Eric, Keller Kowalski, and of course the phenomenal Don Leo Jonathan, just uh, super, super athletes. Uh, you know, my, uh, my philosophy of life is this, do unto others before others do unto you, and it works very, very nicely in a modern society. But really, uh, Don, you know, basically I'm a nice guy, I'm a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyder, I'm in the ring, it's all business. And when I'm outside the ring, I'm, I think I'm a very nice person, but when I'm in the ring, uh, I'm a horrible. I'm a, in fact, I'm a big ass. The shoemakers of Canada voted me the heel of the year. You used to call yourself Canada's greatest Not used athlete. to. I still, you I, still like, do? Well, sure, like, they, uh, like the other day, they were saying, well, you mean to tell me you're a better hockey player than Wade Gretzky? And I said, no, I didn't say that. I said, I was Canada's greatest athlete. what Gretzky is. I said, no, no, there's an understanding, a stipulation. They said, what's that, Gene? I said, Gretzky has to wrestle me first. And I said, if he can put on his skates after he wrestles me, he's a hell of an athlete. No, I, let's face it, you just don't stand a chance against me, a wrestler. I mean, it, you know, once I take you off your feet, it's all over. How did you learn how to talk so well? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't talk about my English is not that good, but uh, I can get my message across. Of course, I went to school at the University of Arizona, and uh, I did uh, take speech. And uh, fortunately, uh, the head of the dorm, East Stadium dorm, Mr. Park, say he was a, a major in speech. Uh, he had a master's. And, um, uh, of course, being in uh, uh, wrestling and, and uh, football, he said, Gene, he said, you're never going to have a job. He said, you're going to be playing uh, football and wrestling all your life, so you better learn how to uh, sell your product. And I said, what product? He said, well, Gene Kaniski. So, naturally, like right now, what I'm doing is selling Gene Kaniski. I've got a few minutes on the air, so damned if I'm not going to sell the big Polak to my fellow Canadian and the American viewing audience. <laughs> Don't leave anybody out. Nobody. <laughs> I need them all. <laughs> What was the highlight of your career? Mm, I guess uh, probably uh, defeating Luthez for the world's title because I can remember I, I thought I had him and I knew it because I'd heard him and uh, uh, God, I was just, now oh, they're going to disqualify me because it was in St. Louis. It was his hometown, the place. So they were just like a bunch of uh, barracudas, uh, piranhas that wanted to get me. And uh, then uh, when I uh, I, uh, I won and I was back in the dressing room, I didn't realize what, uh, what had happened. but. It was all over, and uh, I was a new champion. That was great. And then, of course, the great events when my sons were born. Being a male chauvinist that I am, having two sons, you know, could you imagine me being a father of daughters? Oh, God. Although J.B. Shane and John Tanner are two very different people in height, if nothing else, they have been radio and TV partners since 1968. And through the years, they've entertained tens of thousands. Tanner with his dry wit through such characters as the prune lady and yogurt dweezel, one half of the dweezel sisters. The other half, of course, is Utha Dweezel, played by J.B. Shane, Captain Midnight to his radio friends, Raul Casablanca, to the fans of Night Dreams. When I came here from Kamloops, I started at LG FM. At the time, we were playing Middle of the Road, Montevani, yeah. that type of stuff. That's right. And then I did an interview with a fictitious Russian pianist named Vladimir Kirov, yes. who lost his hands in, in a concert recital in West <laughs> Vancouver when the curtain <laughs> crashed down on the piano board. And from that point on, I thought, well, no, we can't really continue the way we're going, can we? Yeah. It's not right. You, and you made, you made fun. And waves. Yes. Oh, yeah. After that wonderful period of time in radio, John, where did you go and what did you do? Well, we were over at CKVN, which was CFON, and then uh, I went to uh, CF... Well, I worked out in Langley for a few months, uh, and then I went to uh, CFMI, which had some very memorable times there, but ended up in a despair with everyone being booted. Uh, then I went to CJOR, and I worked in the news for almost a year, and that was really fun, actually. I did enjoy doing that. 
Uh, but all along I've been at the planetarium, so you can when see did, Harold yeah, behind when, me. When here. did you hook up with this? Uh, I've been here 20 years now. Now I'm co-producing shows and uh, keep me really busy here. So, But I want to get back in the business, Terry. I really miss it. Unfortunately, they may be best remembered as two of the CKLG employees who in February of 75 tried to organize Canada's first radio union. It was an ugly three-month battle. It wasn't much fun, Terry. Uh, strikes aren't fun at all, you know, and it was, uh, it was a frustrating thing like banging your head on the wall. You know what it was like. I think, what, yeah, what John is saying, too, is that we were, speaking for myself and I, I think for you, pretty naive as to what was going down. The games that were going on behind our back being played on both sides, yep. you know, we were used. And that's how it actually came about. We, we, we did go out there because there was a consensus taken amongst those who, who wanted a union in there, and it came right down to the, uh, the final line was out or, or, or no union, and that's how it happened. I'm going to take you back to your radio days for just a second. Who do you remember best? Probably Mad Mel, one of my favorites, because that was Beatlemania time, and we got to you know meet the Beatles at a press conference in Seattle, and uh, but, uh, you know he was an Aussie. Yeah, <coughs> well, actually, he was from Victoria, but he, he worked in Australia for a while. I remember how Weaver. He came on. He did the morning show following me, and he would come in about three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I knew nothing about the man, and he was out of his mind, and he inspired me. Yeah, me too. He is gone, but God bless him. Uh, he's not forgotten. I can remember you, Tanner, one of the most outrageous things you ever did. I want you to finish the story. Sure. The doors are on stage at the Coliseum. I mean, these are rabid fans. That's right. That was your <laughs> fault that that happened. I remember. What happened? You told people, did you want the doors to come back on stage? And they, ro they roared <laughs> up and attacked the stage, and they blamed me afterwards for that. Oh, that was crazy. You were a little visible target because, first yes. of all, of your size, and you were wearing, if I remember correctly... No, not the Jolly Green Giant suit. I yes. wasn't wearing that. Yes, you were. I? Oh, Terry, Yes, please. you were. Yes, you were. So he, was, he and you were the instigators of Vancouver's <laughs> first rock and roll riot. I'm sorry about that. All right. Would you change anything? That's pretty hard to say. I, I'm pretty happy with the way things have gone, you know. I have a, a good family, and I'm quite happy the way things are. But uh, I'm just waiting for the right radio job to come along. You? I'm torn between two things. One is, uh, would I do it over again? Well, I don't know. I guess maybe I would, because uh, I've had a good time. I've enjoyed it, that what I've done. On the other hand, if I really thought about it, from strictly a financial point of view, the after or the evening that you called me up and said, JB, when you were program director for three weeks, yes. do what you want to do, I might go back to that time and hang up on you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would be financially secure and successful and well-loved. He's well-loved anyway. Following his recent European tour, J.B. Shane continues to entertain guests at his villa in Kitsilano. <laughs> John Tanner, he's not only producing a kid's show for the Planetarium, he's also taking a group tour to Borneo for a March 18th lunar eclipse. <laughs> and Gene keeps in shape by running and working out every day.